Good morning, Restore Church. How are we this morning? It is great to be in the house of the Lord today. My name is Adam Barnes, and I'm the lead pastor of Restore Church. And it is an honor to have you here today. We're excited about what God is doing uh, in this church and in the lives of, of the people here. Man, it is incredible. Uh, it is exciting. So I want to welcome, first of all, our new guests that are here today. We're just so glad you're here today. Let's give a hand uh, to those who are in person, as well as those tuning in online. And there's folks watching all around the world here, and uh, we believe that God can minister not just here alone, but also where you may be watching from. And so I'm excited about it. Would you do me a favor? Would you take out your phones? Uh, we watched this last week as we shared the stream, like, shared, and comment, and that got it in front of more people. And what I really believe is people need to have their faith built in this time. And so this is a sermon series that's not just meant for you right now here watching right in this moment in this room, but it's also people that uh, you may know or uh, you may be in contact, contact with or maybe in your friend's group who also need to hear this message and, uh, and to remind them that there's miracles in this house. And, um, and so I want to I let you know that we are a house of miracles, that we believe that God can move and we, we believe along with the 80% of other Americans that miracles still do exist today and we know where the source of those miracles come from and we're not afraid to say it, we're not afraid to proclaim it, we're not afraid to pray for it uh, and believe in it. And so we, we, uh, we confess the name that is above all names, and that is Jesus Christ. And so uh, I want to just want to encourage you today. I'm excited about the message today. This is the second message in our series. Next week, uh, Pastor Thomas will be bringing the word together, uh, to us together, and uh, his, his, the, the message will be on testimony. I'm excited about that, and, um, and uh, it'll be a great breakthrough message for, for several of you. Some of you have got testimony you want to share, uh, and I would encourage you to start sharing it because what's happening happening is as testimony starts to happen, there's something that bubbles up inside of me. Like I began to witness this week. I'm going to just testify for Jamal right now. Brother got his heart healed and they were celebrating this week of God pouring out a miracle in his life. So Lord, we give you the glory and the honor for that miracle. And we're going to keep celebrating and keep pro proclaiming all that God is doing. And so I, uh, uh, Mike walked in here and he said, I'm in a whole lot of pain. I've been walking in a whole lot of pain in my knees and ankles. And I don't know what it is. As soon as I stepped into this place, uh, I mean, I'm not in any pain any longer. And so just since this service right now, you've got testimony. You've got testimony, and I'm standing on testimony of God's goodness and his faithfulness. Now listen to me. Let me frame this whole message with this one point. I could stop preaching after this one point. Jesus taught the disciples, those who was following this message, and he said, guess what? I serve a God who provides. And he's talking to people who are poor and struggling. They're farmers, and they're, they're people that t tend to land in Galilee. And they were just, they were renting. In fact, they owed taxes to Caesar, and Rome was occupying them. And he still taught them this, listen, this lesson. And after he was talking about the God who's their source of provision, he says listen, this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Listen, 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 listen. Seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. That means not only do you get to know, the, you know about the king, but you get to know him. Right? And all these things will be added to you. Stop looking to, to things. And don't, don't pay attention or don't focus for the, on your need or the miracle that you're asking for or even the miracle that you receive. Don't seek the gift. Seek the giver. And as we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, we're going to watch incredible things happen. Listen, now here's what I want you to do. Are you ready? Today I want you to begin to plow your heart because I believe the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you today. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by plow your heart? Here, let's listen. We got, I want you to pray. I want you to listen. I want you to obey. And then let God add the wow factor to your life. Are you hearing me? Are you with me today? This week, I want you to begin to plow your heart, begin to let God begin to minister to you today. I believe God's setting this stage up for us in the, in the coming weeks and months because um, as we prepare, we're in this season of preparing for what's ahead. And we're believing, you know, doing this, this message series strategically right now as a house praying for miracles, believing that God still shows up, knowing that he does many mighty things and he wants to show up and show off in your life and let you know that he loves you and he's here for you and identify you individually. And so I just, I want to, I want to, I want you to know that God is for you. So as I, as I share today's message, I want you to recognize the seek first, the kingdom of God. This was a, this is, as I began preparing for this message, I want you to know, I felt the, the impression of the Lord just on this phrase, everything you need is in your house. 
Everything you need is in your house. And, and as I began praying, I've been praying about this sermon series for months, and I began thinking about this. And over the last couple of months, I've been going through some, uh, some, some training with, with, uh, with Ready, Set, Grow and a group of other pastors, and we're learning, and I'm leaning in, and I'm growing, and the Holy Spirit's challenging me. In fact, in fact um, there's, a, there's some, a story in the Old Testament where this widow, um, this widow was challenged to, to give her last meal. She had a, she had a, a, a flower and a little bit of water. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 17 and tells this story. And the Holy Spirit just began convicting me to start living in another level of surrender. And so I don't know about you in this place, but maybe God's beginning to stir something into you in your heart to say, what does it look like, Lord? I've said yes to you, but I need to say another level of surrender. I need to give up more. I need to get me out of the way. I need to surrender to you and not hold Hold on to certain things so tightly. And so maybe the Lord will be speaking to you about going to another level of surrender because God wants us to go all in. He doesn't want some of us to go all in. He wants all of us to go all in. And so in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be diving into a sermon series, a challenge, where we're going to be talking about being all in and what that looks like. So I'm excited about it. We're praying about it. Uh, we've been working towards it and believing that God's many mighty things through your life, and uh, it's not by accident that you're here today. Would you pray for us this week? My family and I are about to, to go on an adventure. We're headed to Texas to, to, uh, um, to take our oldest daughter off uh, to college. So today is McKenna's last service here. Um, not ever, but she, uh, she, it'll be our last service for this for a little while, and um, we're excited for you, kiddo, and praying for you, and we're we're looking forward to all the things that God has for you. And so we just want you to know that. So pray for us as we walk through this week. Um, and I'll be praying for you, okay? I don't know what challenges you're walking through, what situations you're facing through, but it is a God who's working on your behalf. And he and I are good friends. And we talk all the time. So here we go. I'm going to pick up a story uh, talking about uh, Elisha in the book of 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, I've got a slide that I want to represent. There's parallel stories or similar stories, as I mentioned, uh, about uh, widows. Both of these uh, stories mentioned are, that I mentioned are about widows, and the Holy Spirit just began speaking uh, uh, to me about that. And, and uh, in 1 Kings chapter 17, uh, there's a conversation uh, about the, the main character in the story is Elijah. He's a prophet, does a whole lot of incredible things. Uh, and then in 2 Kings chapter 4, uh, this is his, his um, I want to say his replacement, but uh, the, the succession, the prophet that follows him, this is Elisha. And the stories are very similar. In fact, you can see that there's two different prophets. Both kind of sound the same. Uh, one has is dealing with flour and oil. Uh, in 2 Kings uh, with Elisha, there's a dealing of oil and jars. The first one you'll you recognize it has more to do with food. The second one has to do with, do with provision. And so there's these similar stories. In fact, if you go read the accounts of these two men, you'll see that these stories are very similar. There's a whole lot of things that go on in Elijah's life as well as Elisha. Now, it's interesting uh, because um, when Elijah was transitioning his ministry over to Elisha, um, Elisha asked Elijah for a double portion. Are you following me? He asked, he said, if I'm going to receive this ministry, I want a double portion. And so you actually see the accounts written out in Elisha's ministry of that double portion taking place. Uh, and it's, 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 it's in scripture there and you can begin to see it. That's why there's so many similarities in ministries, uh, in, in, in miracles that happen in 1 Kings chapters, uh, in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. So I just want you to be aware of that, that this is the same God who answers prayers today. It's the same God who moves mountains today. It's the same God who worked in their lives works today. And so I just want to challenge you a little bit, and I want to begin to, to bring the word of the Lord to you. Let's dive into 2 Kings chapter 4, talking about Elisha and the double portion here. We'll get to it in a moment. Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 says, the wife of a man from the company of prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And do you, and, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditors say, uh-oh, Okay, all right, 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 uh-oh, that, that, yeah. His creditors is coming to take my two boys and as his slaves. 
And Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Let me pause right there for a moment. Some of us actually need to begin to change our question, or the question that we're asking. We're asking questions like, what can I do to help? And the reality of it is, is that sets us up to be a dependent source uh, in someone's life when we just come as a position of help rather than asking them what they have. Why? Because they're just going to, th this widow began to her husband for provision and not the Lord source. And then she began to shift her attention onto the man of God, the prophet there, as another person of providing her source and he began to change the question. And some of you will begin to break through in life. You'll begin to see the miracles happening in a more consistent state when you begin to change the questions you're asking because that may begin to prompt you to recognize what you do have and not keep your eyes focused on what you don't have. There often is this idea that we have lack. And let me tell you what Scripture says, that in Christ Jesus, you have no lack. You lack no good thing. Now, I'm not saying that there's not hard times. I'm not saying there's not moments of struggle. And I'm not saying that there's not those things that happen. And the reality of it is, is that God knew these creditors were coming after her, but he also knew his answer. He also had a solution to the problem. He also wanted to let this woman know that he's her source and not other people. And someone in here needs to recognize that your miracle may not come from other people. It may come from the Lord. And if you begin to recognize that it's from the Lord is your source, the breakthrough actually may be provided through other people. Does it make sense? Okay. All right. You're tracking. So here we go. You have this, this woman who's being challenged. You have this, 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 this pastor's wife who's struggling here in the moment. And so... He asks, tell me what you have in your house. And he says, or she says, your servant has nothing here at all except for a small, uh, small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for a few. Listen, he set her up. <laughs> I'll say it again, Pastor Larry. He set her up. Sometimes we limit what we're asking God for. He said, go around to your neighbors and don't just get a few. Then go inside, shut the door, you and your sons. Listen, not only am I going to do the miracle for you, but I'm going to bring your the next generation that's, that has gone through the hardship, that's witnessed the things, that's felt the effects. I'm going to reach the next generation also. Then go inside, you and your sons, pour the oil into the jars and fill each and put one aside. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's no jars left. Then the oil stopped. He replied, oh, then the oil stopped. She went and told the man of God, she said, and he said, go and sell the oil, pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what's left. And I want you to pay attention to something here. Notice that the woman began to receive the miracle and the children began to live off of it. They began to experience it. And all this week, my family and I began to testify. It was, in, it was incredible to have my kids start witnessing or reminding each other about the miracles that we've seen in our lives. Hey, yeah, do you remember when Aubrey broke her finger when, we, when Courtney began to lay her hand on it and pray for it and immediately it straightened out and we, we uh, had a chance to go. Do you remember when the trailer fell on Aiden's head and almost crushed him and God stepped in and he saw 45 angels? surrounding him. Why? Because he was and then he was five. Right? Like the why when we began to see God ministering and masses reminding, hey dad, 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 I think I think you should preach a message on the process of pain on the way to your miracle. Because you remember when you stepped on my foot and then all of a sudden I looked at my feet and the and the multitudes of warts that were all on my feet disappeared in an instant. And and I and, and I said this last service, I'll say it to you again. That's not my sermon to preach, that's your sermon to preach, and I want you to testify to the miracles of God in your life. 
See, miracles can begin to to can begin to um, skip generations. Why? Because parents live off their miracles. They teach their kids about it, but their kids don't have their own miracles to teach their kids about it, and will stop um, happening in a generation because we lose faith. And so I want to be a church that begins to pass on the, the faith. I want to be a church that begins to pass on what, what, what we believe God for can be our shoulders to launch the next generation off of. And so I, I want to encourage you that everything you need is in the house. It's in the house. Everything you need is in the house. See, God's up to something. He's up to something. He wants to minister to you. He wants to, to reach out to you. See, sometimes we find ourselves in desperate situations and struggles and issues. And here was a pastor's wife who was desperate. Her husband had died. She had no income. Uh, um, you know, uh, Elisha was this ministry school leader, and she goes to him, and she said, your servant, my husband is dead. You know that he feared the Lord, and, 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 but the creditors are coming after him to take my sons as slaves. You know, as I hear this, as I read this, I hear a little bit of complaining in this woman's voice. I hear a little bit of like this almost bitterness of like, God, I've got this problem. I've got this situation. Where are you, God? Where did you, sh how come you're not showing up? I'm going to go to the man of God. and begin There's an, almost a sense of entitlement that's, that's taking place here. Do you hear it? Do you hear this, this moment as this woman's beginning to talk? Let me tell you something for a moment. The root of, of complaining is when a person feels like they're not getting what they deserve. Who? Who? I'm glad I don't deserve. Listen, she's saying, she's saying, my husband served the Lord and now we're destitute. Now we don't have any savings, no insurance, no, no property. I don't have anything. I, I now have regret uh, and, 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 and worry and fear of the future is beginning to take shape in my life. Well, listen, some people crucify themselves between two thieves, regret of your past and worries about your future. The pressure she feels is necessary for her to get to her miracle. I'm not saying you can't get a miracle without pressure. Sometimes there's a moment, a breakthrough moment, when that pressure is relieved and you're like, it's only God. Let me tell you something where pressure was relieved when Israel was standing just walked away with the entire nation of Egypt, their, their owners, all of their wealth. They had all of their gold. They began to, they walked out as, as free. They were slaves. Now they're free. They're backed up against this, this body of water behind them. And now the army of Egypt is pursuing them to capture them once again. God delivered them and they find themselves in this predicament. Pressure is mounting. The, they're coming. The dust cloud's coming. We don't have anywhere to go. What happens if God takes that moment of pressure and begins to make a way where there seems to be no way. Let me tell you, there's a situation, you back me up and be up against the wall and something may be pressuring you on one side, but you pause and plow your heart and let God begin to add the wow factor and watch what he does. So here we have a moment, here we have a moment where God shows up and you read about these moments over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture. You read about Abraham and Isaac and how the God provided a ram in a moment. You, you read about um, how the women were on their way to the tomb and the stone was rolled away. You don't, we don't ever preach about that being a miracle. How could a woman actually by herself begin to roll away a stone? She was preparing spices for the, Jesus' burial, and yet the stone was rolled away. Do you realize what a miraculous thing that would be for her? We don't preach about that. We don't talk about that. We don't tell that testimony. Perhaps you, you recognize the testimony where Jesus uh, is in standing in front of 5,000 people and he looks over his disciples and says, they're hungry, you feed them. And the disciples are like, what do we have? They're looking at their lack. We don't have anything. I don't have enough for anything. And, he, and they, they, But we've got five loaves and two fish. We've got this little boy's lunch over here. God says that's enough. Watch what I could do. Listen, Elijah says to me, what, oh, to, to, this, to this woman, the widow, what shall I do for you? 
Tell me, changes the question. Tell me, what do you have in your house? Everything you need is in your house. Sometimes I think we miss miracles because we don't look for them where God hides them. I mean, we're waiting for the obvious miracles to smack us in the face. But I think there's more miracles that happen around our lives that we don't pay attention to because we're not looking for them where God hides them. I mean, Proverbs chapter two, verse, or 25, verse 2 says this. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the glory of kings to search a matter out. And so what I want to leave you with a few points as we bring this home that you can walk away with this sermon about this understanding that that one, you've got to start with what you have. There's where the seeds of miracles take place. The widow could only see what she didn't have. And God will use what you have if you're faithful. He will give you more. Listen, it's, 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 in, it's incredible to me in these moments about what happens. He, he, he could have provided the oil, but he said, no, go and get the jars. So she went around and started getting jars. Number two, if you're taking notes, listen, there, there's something that stands out to me very clearly that perhaps we've got to do something different. You've got to change the negative into a possibility. We often say that we've got to change the negative into a positive, and that's just an ending statement that doesn't leave room God for God to show up. We just change what we're saying. Rather than changing the negative into a possibility, recognizing that something else has to be added to the equation for something to happen. See, it's easy to look at our situation and, and, and tell about the difficulties and the challenges of a situation. In fact, her response was, your maidservant has nothing. There's negative. That's the, nothing. I don't have anything. It's negative. But what happens here is that she begins, she says, the, but, let me tell you something here. She began to change the equation. She began to change it, not with a positive, but with a possibility. There began to be a seed of hope that was being placed here in a moment. Faith does not deny the reality of something bad. Listen to me. Sometimes we think we're just going to overlook and pretend like it doesn't happen. No, that's just stupidity. The reality of it is, is you could be in a, a bad situation and recognize that, God, this is a bad situation, and the only one that's going to be able to make a way is you. So I lean in on you. I recognize the chasm of where I am to where you need to show up. But, God, I lean in on you. No matter what the circumstances or situations look like, I'm going to lean in on you you. So change the negative to a possibility because I serve a God that, that, that anything is possible. And he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Number three, I, something I see in this, in this message that I want you to take away is that faith is not faith until you do what faith is saying. Let me say that one more time. Faith is not faith until you do what faith is saying. It's so easy to come here to church and say, Lord, I confess you as Lord Jesus of my life and live like out of here, outside of here, live like you're the Lord of your life. Well, that's your problem. That's why you're not seeing the miracles around you that really God's trying to use to point to him. If you begin to yield your heart to Jesus and you let him be the Lord of your life, not just here in a moment when it's easy to pray a prayer of faith, but actually walk it out in your every life day to day. Lord, I surrender to your will and to your way. God, come be the Lord of my life. I surrender to you. Thank you for saving me. The biggest, baddest, raddest, most miraculous kind of miracle you could ever experience in your life is to experience the gift of salvation. That means you're no longer damned to hell, but you can get into into the gates of heaven and Jesus will welcome you home as friend. I've seen cancer healed. I've seen miracles happen. I've seen kidney stones dissolve. I've seen legs grow out. I've seen people who are thought to be dead come alive. I've, I've, seen, I've seen miracles happen. I've witnessed it in my kids and my family. I've witnessed it in this church and we've testified to it happening even before the service started. So I don't know what you came in here expecting God to do, but I have high expectations that God's going to show up. And he's not failed me yet. So I want to remind you that everything you have, you, that you need, is you have in the house. I also want to remind you of this. 
that two-thirds of the word God is go. For you English teachers out there, I'm right. I know I say things like gooder and gooder that's not proper English, but the reality of it is two-thirds of the word God is go. And some of us have been pausing and waiting. Some of us have been, have been holding back the things that we really need to be pouring out. And I know you may think, oh, I'm going to look like an idiot. I, oh, I, it, it's, it's, it's the same thing that Elisha challenges this woman with when he says, go to your neighbors and ask for a bowl. I mean, in that day, it would be just as ridiculous as it would be today. You don't go to your neighbors and say, hey, do you have a mixing bowl or a pot or a jar that I could have? Um, No, you go and ask for flour or eggs or oil or an ingredient that you need. It would be kind of silly. You got a mixing bowl? It, would be, it was silly then. So, so there may be something that God asked you to do that steps out to your side, your comfort zone. And the encouragement of the prophet wasn't just to do it a little bit, but to do it a lot. Put all your heart into it. Go, to, go get a lot, not just a little. Believe God for more. I want to remind you that everything you need is in your house. God's going to begin to supply that we're a house of miracles. I want to tell you a quick story. It's a true story. Um, any of you remember the Beverly Hillbillies? Yeah. Well, um, during the Great Depression, there was a man named Yates, and he was operating a sheep ranch in the rolling hills of West Texas. West Texas happens to be between the middle of Waxahachie and Waco, Texas, is West, West Texas. And his business wasn't generating enough money to pay the principal and interest on his mortgage, so he ended up living on government subsidy. And, and his days were filled with stress over the financial concerns of his family. And they lived in dis- distress, and they ate in poverty, and they struggled and toiled. And then one day, a seismic crew, a, a seismographic crew, asked if they could explore his land um, for oil. And Yates agreed and signed a, a, a contract. And at uh, 1,115 feet, they struck an oil reserve. And the first well produced 80,000 of thousand barrels a day. Um, and there were more wells that generated twice, as amount, twice the amount of oil on his property. For 30 years after the discovery of that well, one well was still emitting um, a potential th- flow of 125,000 barrels a day, a day. Listen, that's a lot of money. That's, that's, a, that's a whole lot of money. This, there, there was, the reality of it is, is this vast amount of wealth belonged to the Yates family. They were multimillionaires who spent years in gut-wrenching poverty because they didn't realize what they already possessed. There are believers who live uh, in gut-wrenching spiritual poverty because they don't recognize the wealth of what it means to have Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so this morning, I want to just charge up your faith and challenge you and encourage you that God has something for you, that there's miracles in this house. And we believe in the power of prayer, and we believe that going after God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, he's worth our worship. This is the only time in eternity that you will be able to worship on August 14th of 2022. So he deserves your worship for all eternity for the day that he created today. So we're going to worship the Lord together, and we believe that he's moving in a mighty way. Would you stand to your feet with me for a moment? As we lean into worship here in the next few moments, I I believe that some of you have come in here positioned for a miracle, meaning you want a miracle, you're praying for a miracle. We're going to stand with you. We've got folks that will stand up here who've got prayer tags on in the front and in the back who want to pray with you, have been praying for you, and want to stand in agreement with you. If you would like prayer for any reason, we'd like to pray for you. Maybe you need a miracle in your marriage. Maybe you need a miracle in your finances. Maybe you need a miracle in your family. Maybe you want to stand in the gap for someone, and you're believing for God 
God to show up in their lives. Maybe it's your children who are far away from God and you're going to believe for a miracle that God would show up in their lives somehow. I've watched incredible things happen. And so I, I, I want to stand with you. We want to stand in agreement with you. We want to believe in you. And I want you to know that testimonies are increasing in this body. And so if you would like to share your testimony, we can help other people know and be encouraged by it. Because here's what happens. When you share your testimony, then my heart gets encouraged. And I'm like, yeah, Lord, whatever you did for them, you could do for me. And I'm going to stand. I'm going to borrow your faith. We're going to stand together in agreement and believe that what God could do. Because amen means this. Let it be so or this. Do it again, God. Do it again, God. So, Lord, we say yes to your will and to your way. And if you're walking in here and you're so far away from God and you're, you're tied up in all kinds of darkness and, 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 and despair and anxiety and sin and, and things that separate you from God, I believe right now you could be set free. And I believe that God can become the Lord of your life if you ask Jesus in your heart. It's as simple as just praying a prayer with me. So if you would bow your heads with me, every bow, head bowed and eyes closed. If you just invite the Lord in your heart, you could do it in your mind. And if you would make this real, like real, like you're talking to me, like I'm talking to you real. If you would just ask the Lord, say, Lord Jesus, I confess my sin to you. I acknowledge you as God. And I want to make you Lord of my life to sit on the throne of my heart. I invite you in. I confess my sin. Forgive me. Set me free. Make me whole. Save me. Redeem me. In Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that right now, by prayer in that and faith in that, that you may have entered the gates of heaven. It's not a, it's not a, your name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life, meaning Jesus calls you friend. He's calling you home, a place to belong, a place to, to lean into. And so we want to come alongside you in your journey of faith. I challenge you to let one of these prayer partners know your decision today. If you made that, prayed that prayer for, for real for you, we'd love to follow along with you and help you in your journey of faith. But we believe God's got something for you. So let's press into worship for a moment. I'm going to pray blessing over you. And let's dive on in. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for what you're doing today. I pray that as a sign of your hand working today, you would move in many miraculous ways, that we would begin to testify over and over and over again. I pray for those who are experiencing back pain or confusion of thoughts, swirling thoughts, anxiety, panic attacks. God, I come against the hand of the enemy. Lord, I pray for hearts to be restored and made new. God, I thank you that you're beginning to do it. Lord, I pray for ankles and knees and backs. And God, I pray that all of these things would point back to you. I pray that we would begin to see more of the most miraculous things we could ever experience and that's salvation that's being saved and set free. Lord, I pray that we begin to see an increase of that. I pray that I pray for lost children, prodigal sons and daughters, that they would come home, that they would find a way back to you. God, I pray that you would encourage the lonely right now, that you would encourage those who feel far from you. God, I pray that you begin to encourage our brothers and sisters to know that they're connected, to know that you, you see them and you love them. God, I thank you for the gifts that you're pouring out in this body. Let this house be a house of miracles that bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's let's lean into worship church.